the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. We are now in week number six. Week six. And as we approach the journey, we, the end of it, we are still looking in the, the type or the image in the Old Testament when the children of Israel were also baptized. The children of Israel were baptized into Moses and into the cloud. They were baptized in the Red Sea. And through their crossing of the Red Sea, God formed his people. The defining moment of the people of Israel, what made them a people, was the Passover and the crossing over into the desert through the Red Sea. And of course, later on, when they receive the law on Sinai. But our experience is, like we said before, like when the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. When they were baptized, they did not cross straight into the Promised Land. They crossed into the desert so that they could struggle, so that also through that struggle and through their trials and actually through them seeing the work of God in their lives and taking care of them, they can really, on the inside, be formed as the children of God. So, from the outside, they participated in the Passover, and they crossed the Red Sea, all of them. But there was still an issue on the inside. They were not really the people of God on the inside. And that's why, again, this reference, which I always love to look at in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, when St. Paul, when Saint Paul, when Saint Paul uh, explains to them that they were all baptized, they also all ate the same spiritual food. They all also drank the same spiritual drink. Sort of like what we do today, we were all baptized, we all received the spiritual food and the spiritual drink from the altar. But then St. Paul says, but with most of them, God was not pleased. And despite that they supposedly saw the miracles, they supposedly saw the manna coming down from heaven and the quail flying in from nowhere. They supposedly saw the water flowing out of the rock. When the real time of faith came and God is saying, here is the promised land. Here it is. All you need to do is accept and cross over into it. They lacked the faith. And it was apparent at that point that they did not see. They were blind. And that is why God then said to them, you are all saying that we are going to die and our children are going to be slaves to the Amorites and the people of Canaan? Well, go back into the desert and you will surely die, but you're not going to die at war. You're going to die in the desert. And your children, whom you're afraid of becoming slaves, are going to be the ones who are really my people, formed on the inside. Even though that second generation didn't see, didn't see the miracles in Egypt, or if they did, they didn't remember them because they were very young. So it's ironic that the people who didn't see the great work of God in that first generation 
were the ones who ultimately entered into the promised land. And that is why Jesus then said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see. So we are also all baptized. We are all also receiving the many gifts of God, whether in a spiritual level or even in a regular, you know, practical, although I don't really like that word as if the spiritual isn't practical, but in our everyday life, let's call it that. We see God's blessing, the way he takes care of our lives, the way he manages our lives as deemed fit, like we say in the liturgy. And we are given everything to see the hand of God in our everyday life. And yet, sometimes we are unable to see. And that is the, the, the image of the Pharisees that we see in the gospel reading today. Supposedly the children of God, supposedly the learned, educated, the people who know the scriptures back to front and the other way around and inside and out, cover to cover. And yet what does Jesus call them at the very end of the story? He says that you are blind. And the blindness isn't because they didn't see the miracles or because, they, I mean, they didn't, it's not because the witnesses, were, sorry, the miracles weren't done in front of them. It's because despite the miracles being done in front of them, they refused to see. And what are the things that make us unable to see? We read today in the letter of St. Paul, he said, we have to let go of everything, of all the things that could be in our souls. So if you read, for example, Colossians, there we go, Colossians chapter 3. So he, he, he speaks, put to death what is earthly in you. Fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, anger, wrath malice, slander, foul talk from your mouth. So it goes all the way from the most evil things that we can imagine sometimes, evil desire, and then we can also start adding, oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't kill anybody. I'm not a bad person. And then we wonder why we don't see God. Because the issue isn't how bad are your sins. The issue is, is the heart pure so that it can see God? that it can recognize God or recognize his hand at work in our life around us or the willingness to really have God work inside our heart, the willingness to really be changed, the willingness to admit that I am wrong, the willingness to say that I'm being selfish or I'm ignoring the truth that's right in front of me, or I'm un unable to love the people around me. All these things that he says over here, anger, wrath, malice, slander, gossip, foul talk, those silly small things that we sort of discount, those are the things that could be in our heart that are preventing us from seeing God. Many of us could be going through a tough time in our lives and wondering, where is God? Why can't I see him? And the answer could be, could be, that just as when you are in your own home and you know where everything is because that's the home you live in, and then if there's a power outage, you still know how to feel around the house and you almost know because you have in your head where everything is. If you need to get something out of a drawer when there's no power, you can almost feel your way around and maybe even not always feel your way, you almost know it. But if you are unable to see in unknown territory someone else's house that you don't know very well, instantly you feel lost. 
instantly you are stuck where you are and unable to move. In the same way, if God is unfamiliar territory, when there is light available, when things are easy, it's no guarantee that we will see him because as soon as the lights go out and there's a, a time of darkness, a time of trouble, because God is unfamiliar territory, we are unable to find him. We read in the Psalms and we also read it in many times throughout our prayer day. You see it in Agbeya. In your light, we shall see light. Because you are the light of the world that comes to that you are the light that comes to every man coming into the world that gives light to every man coming into the world what does that mean it means that to the degree that we are able to experience the presence of God in our life in our daily life in our everyday life in the work that we do the school that we go to, the bus that we ride, the people that we see, if we are able to see God in all of those things, then we are able to see him when there is nothing to see, when there is nothing good to see, when there is nothing good to live in, when we feel that our lives are broken, then he will show up. Then when we, as we read in the psalm earlier, he's saying, you know, quickly give ear to me. Hear me speedily, O Lord, for my spirit has failed. Do not turn, your ba turn back your face from me. You know, this idea of seeking the face of God throughout everything in our life is the most important thing. Again, the psalm. To you my heart has said, I sought your face. Your face, O Lord, I will seek. Do not turn your face away from me. That is where we find our comfort, despite anything else that's going around in our life. Think about it. The blind man who was healed, who wouldn't even know what green was because he'd never seen it. He was born blind. He wouldn't even know what a face was because he'd never seen it. And what is the first face that he ever sees? It's probably the face of Christ. Jesus put the clay on his face. He spat on the ground and said, go wash. And he says he came back seeing. Or maybe he didn't. Because as soon as he opened his eyes, he was walking back and everyone's looking at him and then the people crowded around him. Oh, look, this man is able to see now. But he still remembers. A man called Jesus. That's the memory. How much do we remember of who it is who opened our eyes? Glory be to God forever. Amen. Just a very quick announcement, just so that you realize what's happening today. Uh, you might have seen an announcement that we sent out earlier this week that we are starting to tweak some of the hymns that we're going to be praying in the liturgy. So today when we sing the cherubim worship you, it's going to sound a little bit different. We did send out a recording. Some of you might have heard it. So every month or two, we're going to be tweaking one of the regular hymns that we do in the liturgy. Five hymns, uh, the cherubim worship you, and uh, through the intercession of the Mother of God, St. Mary, uh, may their holy blessings, amen, 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 and as it was, those five main hymns in the liturgy, they're going to be tweaked so that they can sound a little more like what all the other churches in the country are singing it. So 